Welcome! It's Monday, <clears throat> probably. Uh, it's actually Wednesday for me today, so starting off the new days of lecture with my nice Sriracha shirt. So today I would like to ask you in the comments section, or if there's a Moodle forum that I've posted for this, post any recommendation on whether or not we keep this format. Today I'm planning on doing two, maybe three lectures on the subject matter that we have. And then I'm going to move it on to whether we do Instagram, which would be, you know, a live stream, and then it would delete within 24 hours, thus being, being, getting a bit more synchronicity, or whether we do more activity sheets, or whether we do, you know, some other format. So I know by now, if, uh, if we're still doing these lectures and it's Monday, you've had one week of experiencing different professors taking different methods to deal with the shutdown and you've probably sampled and see what you can do. I can't do everything. I'm not going to do Zoom because I have 113 students who, you know, need to use it at once and someone's bound to not get there and, you know, video. Video would probably work better than that. But yeah, I'm welcome to suggestions is what I'm saying and I'd love to hear them. If not, then I'll probably take a few more lectures when I get back. Also, you should probably know that if, uh, if we are indeed canceled for this long, I'm probably at home with my kids more often than not because their school would be canceled as well. So, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens. Anyway, welcome back, and let's get this party started. That is not the right button. That's the advanced slide for this. We're doing animal diversity today. Okay, two computers, can't figure it out. Animal diversity today. So, grab open that slide or that PowerPoint, put it over here so that you can have a good window of that while you're watching this lovely video. And I know I said at the beginning of the semester, the only thing worse than lecture is videos online. So eating those words. I think that should improve the that doesn't improve me. That improves the slides. Here you go. Hopefully that helps you see the notes better. Write in the comment section. That'd be helpful. Okay. Advanced slide to objectives. Draw a phylogeny including the sponges, the cnidarians, the mollusks, the arthropods, and the deuterostomes. So I'll draw that up here on the board, and we'll probably closer to the end of the lecture for all of that. Be able to map adaptations to phylogeny, meaning just show where these arose. So true tissues arose before the cnidarians, but after the sponges. Jointed limbs is an arthropod thing. Bilateral symmetry is what we call the bilaterians. Segmentation arose both in annelids and in arthropods and in deuterostomes, and deuterostome growth arose in the deuterostomes. That is really not that hard. To find terms like Cambrian explosion, Ediacaran biota, Cnidarian, deuterostome, and basically any words you are not familiar with, you can either look them up on dictionary.com or you can look them up in the back of your textbook. I really hope you brought your textbook home. If not, there's dictionary.com. Uh, relate the Cambrian explosion to invertebrate diversity. So this is kind of a, an interesting thing going on there. Describe a body plan in terms of symmetry, segmentation, and tissues. You'll know it when you see it. And list it one, at least one trait for each of the Lophotrophozoans, Ecdysozoans, and Deuterostomes. Be, be, be able to define that trait. So <coughs> don't just tell me that Lophotrophozoans have a Lophophore. Be able to define Lophophore. It, it's new. Okay. What are animals? So advanced slides, one of the kitten. Dang, that's where we are. Animals. Hooray! Finally, we brought the animals. The heterotrophic multicellular eukaryotes. Heterotrophic multicellular. Well, you can put some example question that says something like, what's true about all animals? And the answer, one of the answers is they all have a nucleus. Yes. Yes, they do. <laughs> okay. So animals are uh, also have distinct tissue types. So we also add them in their true tissues. And we'll get to what those mean. Not a box of Kleenex. We'll move on that onto that. And they are, well, they're faster moving than fungi and plants. That's, that's really the way we see animals is it's that thing that can move quicker than a fungus or a plant because it has, well, muscles. And muscles come from a true tissue. So 
Uh, there we go. Advanced slide. Eukaryotes arose about 700 million years ago, and this is some of the early animals that we see. Eukaryotes. I mean animals. Animals. Animals arose 700 million years ago. Yeah, I want to do a second. Idiocarian biota were soft-bodied early animals found in this Australian fossil bed. So the uh, Idiocarian biota weren't the animals that gave rise to the animals we have today. These soft-bodied uh, early animals were actually, the, the way that they grew was just increasing their surface area by increasing their body size. So you see worms, but the worm is flat. You think, oh, like a flatworm. Kind of. Instead of having internal digestive organs, they may be absorbing from the outside. So some of these just kind of had an increase in body size being their developmental way of increasing uh, diffusion across the surface area. And increasing body size is a good way of increasing diffusion across the surface area. The problem is most of these animals that we see in the idea of biota, they are not the, uh, they are not the animals we see today. They are not the ancestors of the animals we see today. They were basically a plan A, but plan B is what actually what we actually got. So this is one of those interesting moments where life could have gone another direction, but it didn't. Having internal digestive organs and an internal increase in surface area for diffusion, lungs, the or gills for most animals, I know. So having these kind of things ended up being the norm as opposed to just an increase in fossil in, in body size. So these animals, however, were capable of doing something that nothing had been able to do before, which was graze on algae. So algae was coating a lot of these rocks, and what it did, well, a free swimming bit of plankton couldn't really do much to that algae growing on the rocks, but these idea carin biota, these animals, they could graze on the algae, giving them a, a good food source and a primary producer that had no defenses against being grazed on. So it was a new niche. And I want to point out some of these new niches as they arose because I want you to imagine every time a new niche is occupied, it has n the animal that first occupies it has zero competition. And when it has zero competition, it can kind of expand and increase its biodiversity. So this would be evolutionarily successful of being able to, um, to expand biodiversity by occupying a new niche. And that's what we see with these new animals. They're capable of grazing on algae. They're herbivores. We haven't had herbivores before. And so, advanced slide. So the first animals were actually phytophores, sponges, but sessile. Sessile. They stay in one spot. They're not rooted to the ground so much as attached to a substrate and incapable of moving from that substrate. So sponges, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants has pants and legs and arms and can move, but SpongeBob locked in place on the substrate pants is a very boring show, but that's how sponges work. They're feet, filter feeders, so they're going to be eating plankton. They do not have true tissues. They're animals. But they don't have true tissues. They do have things called colonocytes. These collared cells that are capable of uh, whipping this flagellum back and forth to kind of move air at uh, water, move water into and through <clears throat> the collar where food particles will get stuck on a mucus sleeve. Yum. Then they can ingest them through phagocytosis, and the phagocytosis will allow them to bring it over to amoebocytes. Other cells that are specialized for phagocytosis and moving around the sponge. So you have the amoebocytes, you have the coanocytes, and you have various spicules, which are basically sponge skeleton, and that's what makes up a sponge. Very simple. Uh, water moves through, it moves into the sponge by pores, and then it will move out through the osculum at the top of the sponge. So there's a water flow that is created by this animal, and 
This water flow allows it to eat plankton, but it's sessile. It stays in one place. It's not a big hunting animal. It's almost like a plant, but it doesn't photosynthesize. It's almost like a fungus, but it doesn't use hyphae. It's just able to pump a lot of water. And this is the very root of our phylogenetic tree that would be, uh, you know, I could probably just do it on this side. You have, so you have some sort of protists, sponges. So the sponges are at the very bottom of our family tree, phylogenetic tree. Next on there would be the cnidarians. Advanced slide. These are what are called eumetazoa. True animals. True big life is what this would actually mean. You meaning true, meta meaning big, zoe meaning life, so true big life, I don't know, true big animals. And these would be the next things that come off of our phylogenetic tree are the cnidarians. They have true tissues. We're going to fill that in a little bit later. So what type of tissues? Well, they do have, a, they have muscle tissue, nervous tissue, digestive tissue. Where those come from, we'll get there. It's got a gastrovascular cavity. I'm just going to write that G, V, C, gastrovascular cavity. So what that is, essentially, is a large pocket inside the animal that the food goes into, and it's close to all the cells, so the diffusion can actually just diffuse the nutrients from the food into the nearby cells, and when they're done eating, they, you know, vomit it out. Vomit, poop, it's the same, it's the same aperture. It's just one whole stuff goes in, gets digested, comes back out. I mean, it's a two-way digestive tract, hooray, special event. But that's what they are. It's a gastrovascular cavity. So they put food in the gastrovascular cavity and are capable of digesting it there using their tissues. And there are these fierce predators that can actually move around and move and feed on plankton. So it's a new niche. It's a planktivore, but not a sessile one. A moving one, so it has, you know, muscle tissue. Muscle and nervous tissue. So having muscle and nervous tissue allows it to coordinate responses and move around the substrate. So you can see also there are hydrozoa, which are the hydrozoans, cyphozoa, the jellyfish, and anthozoa, the sea anemones. These are all present in the cnidarians in different types of cnidarians. And they also have something called a cnidoblast. C-N-I-D-O-B-L-A, actually, yeah, S. It's the, uh, the most complex organelle. It allows them to, it's an organelle that basically shoots out a small harpoon, and that harpoon contains poison that will stun an animal. This is how jellyfish and sea anemones are going to be uh, doing their job. So, C N I D O B L A S T, Nidoblast. They're capable of using those things to stun their prey so they can eat it. Now, I said stun, not kill. They eat it alive. All right, <clears throat> then along comes something, called the, comes something called the Cambrian Explosion. So the hypotheses are kind of rich. So one hypothesis is, and I advanced slides to the Cambrian Explosion here, one hypothesis is that the, some mutations in Hox genes allowed more uh, diversification and expansion of different types of animal forms. That is likely, well, yeah, it seems to be very true that there are more Hox genes present in things after the Cambrian explosion, things that evolved after the Cambrian explosion, than things that evolved, like Cnidarians, before the Cambrian explosion. So that's one bit of the hypothesis, is that there are now more body plans available for animals to use. So it's just the number of genes present for body plants. Another hypothesis is that the greater amount of oxygen in the atmosphere 
allowed for larger creatures and these larger creatures were well it's a new niche you can be big now so if you're big you can eat things that are smaller and if you're bigger you can eat things that are smaller than whatever you were before so <clears throat> or whatever else exists so more evolution into larger and larger animal sizes allows more forms to exist uh, some other hypotheses <clears throat> one simple one is these were animals that fossilized better so there were plenty of animals around beforehand but Jellyfish ain't got no bones. The fossilization doesn't work very well for some of these animals. So there was a dearth of fossils, and then suddenly there is a ton of fossils, a surplus from a surfate, realistically. So a ton of fossils suddenly appearing in the fossil record because they fossilized better. So that would be a kind of sampling bias thing. The Cambrian explosion also exists only for a few different... Um, a few different places that we can actually find these fossils, such as the Burgess Shales in Canada. So a different hypothesis is that these animals diversified and became more plentiful, but only migrated into the areas where we see these fossils after they became diverse. So there was an explosion, yes, but it was slower than we would think because we just where, where we do have fossils before the Cambrian explosion, those animals weren't there at the time. So it's just like a, a rapid movement of these animals around the globe, kind of like the rapid movement of cats into the Western Hemisphere in the 16th century and 17th century. Suddenly there are cats in the Western Hemisphere. Where did they come from? Boats. So they just appear, but they had evolved elsewhere. So that's kind of a, another hypothesis is just that there's another sampling bias based on where we're finding all of these samples. And the Cambrian explosion is also a real fun one. Uh, a creationist would say that the Cambrian explosion is proof against is evidence for creation because it's evidence against evolution. You have very few fossils and then suddenly you have a ton of fossils. Ah, uh, see evolution can't explain that. What explains it better is a global flood. It doesn't actually work for explaining that either. It just suddenly everything got buried. No, that, that doesn't work very well for that either. But it is an interesting question for evolution, and this does call back to our, uh, our, hypoth our theory of punctuated equilibrium, that there's long periods of stasis and sudden periods of expansion. That might be another rationale for the Cambrian explosion. These different hypotheses are largely non-exclusive of one another, except for creation, which says all the other ones are wrong. Um, they're largely non-exclusive. It could be that more animals with harder skeletons because it could exist because there's a higher oxygen concentration and these skeletons and different body shapes arose because of the Hox genes and they all kind of arrived in this Cambrian, these Cambrian strata at the same time because of some other global change. A lot of hypotheses for the Cambrian explosion and a lot of these really do dig into our very theories of evolution. And what we do see though is most of these animals that we see now, the arthropods, the mollusks, the annelids, the brachiopods, the chordates, the echinoderms, the vivarian, and it's all of those, we see them really first in the Cambrian. We see a lot of them in the Cambrian. The Nigerians and the sponges, we've got fossils of them, as much as we can, from well before the Cambrian as well. So a great explosion of life. And also a new niche <laughs> defended uh, highly mobile predators with claws and things. So uh, advanced slide. This is one of those animals with claws. And they would have these claws to, well, chew through or catch different animals. We also have herbivores that would then have shells on them, so they get this kind of building up. And again, if you have an animal with claws, it fossilizes well because claws fossilize well. If you have an animal with a shell, it fossilizes well because there's a shell present and shells fossilize. So it could be kind of some of each. All right, let's move on to the bilactarians, and I'm going to erase backwards because we've got a lot more animals to cover. I know, it's not fun sitting through a lengthy lecture, but at least you can pause me now. If you want to, just yeah, you can take any time. Just pause me. I'll, I'll be here when you come back, unless the internet goes down. And as we move into the bilaterians, it's uh, we're going to see that this bilateral symmetry. We'll cover that in a minute. We're going to see that have a complete digestive tract. So not just a gastrovascular cavity, but a complete digestive tract that will be able to swallow and kind of move over the food or move the food through it. And that's what's going to be evolving next is going to be your bilateral 
symmetry, and something else we'll cover in a moment. They evolved about 680 to 700 million years ago, but expanded in the Cambrian. Advanced slide. Symmetry, body plans. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we have radial versus bilateral. Just like the flowers. Uh, remember those days before spring break when we could come to class and look at flowers together? Good times. Radial symmetry, you can cut it any different way and you're going to get the same kind of reflection. A bilateral symmetry, there's only one way really to cut it, whether it be a lobster or a shovel, they're bilaterally symmetrical. We also have the terms dorsal versus ventral. And for that, we're really thinking about animals that, uh, what's, what's their top and their bottom? Dorsal fin of a shark is going to be on its top. The ventral fins are, are going to be at the bottom. We, we think about, okay, dorsal, ventral, no. Dorsal, ventral. We used to be four-legged animals. Well, I mean, not humans, but, okay, heck, humans. Yeah, we used to, you know, crawl around. So dorsal being your back, your dorsal vertebrae, your dorsal nerve cord, ventral being your stomach, arthropods will have a ventral nerve cord. This is something they have that's different than us. So ventral and dorsal are ways we're looking at it top and bottom. There's also anterior versus posterior. And that should be a little easy if you're said, I'm going to kick your posterior. It's, it's the behind. So you kick a crayfish in its posterior, you're kicking its tail. You kick a crayfish in its anterior, you're kicking its claws. It's um, the front end. And take a moment to think. Most animals that have this bilateral symmetry are going to have a distinct anterior and posterior end. And you're going to see a phenomenon called cephalization. And cephalization is the movement of sensory organs towards the anterior end. Why do most animals have their sensory organs on their anterior end? That's right, because the anterior end comes in contact with the environment first, if they're scuttling around anterior first. If they're scuttling around backwards, then the anterior end is going to come into contact last, and that's just not a good way to move. All right, advanced slide. Tissues. Here we go. You're going to like this when you take A and P. It's some good stuff right here. Tissues. So, there's the ectoderm and endoderm. Ectoderm. Endoderm. And these are both present here in the Niberians. Ectoderm. Endoderm. We're going to see here something called mesoderm arising later. So mesoderm is going to be the interior. So the ectoderm gives rise to the covering of the animal. It also gives rise to the central nervous system. Kind of nifty. Your ectoderm gives rise to the central nervous system. The MCAT always tries to trip you up with something like that. The endoderm, think endo like a... Uh, Endovirus? No. It doesn't work so well. Endometrial? No. Eh, endoderm. Digestive tract, liver, lungs. And the mesoderm is in between the ectoderm and endoderm and gives rise to the muscles and most other organs. You can see here the ectoderm in blue, the endoderm in yellow, and the mesoderm in red. Now sometimes you'll have what's called a coelo, which is a body cavity lined with mesoderm tissue. Uh, worms here have a coelom, and both sides are aligned with mesoderm. This is a, uh, the cavity of the body, so uh, it's a space between organs, is the coelom. So most animals have a coelom. Some animals have a pseudo coelom. Where you have, so Endoderm, ectoderm, and 
the space in the middle is your pseudo sea level. So endoderm in the middle, line in the middle, ectoderm on the outside, and pseudo sea level in there. So that would be something like a uh, nematode would have a pseudo sea level. Advanced slide. So we're going to continue looking at animals. And I do want to point out as well, most animals aren't humans. And I do remember that when we covered protists, well, they're boring because they're not multicellular. They're, they're kind of, when we covered prokaryotes, they're boring because they don't have complex organelles. We covered protists, they're boring because they're not multicellular. We covered fungi, uh, fungi they're boring because they're not big. We covered plants, they're boring because they are, they're not moving around. We're covering animals, good, finally, sponges, boring, they don't move around. Uh, and then we say cnidarians, well, they're kind of dull because they're, they're simple. And we keep on going forth. Remember, most animals are not going to be humans. Most animals are adapted perfectly to their environment and are really cool and really diverse. But I know it's not you. You'll have time to study you, don't worry. In Bio 328, Bio 329, um, human psychology, if you take any psych courses, uh, kinesiology, you know, you have plenty of time to study humans later. This is the cool stuff we're going to cover now. We're not going to get to cover Lophotrochozoans in human bio. So take some time, enjoy the rest of the world, the other 99.9999% of life on Earth. Take some time, some pretty cool animals here, so give them their due. All right. And here's advanced slide, a huge number of animals in a big old phylogeny. Ah, uh, yes. Evolutionary, evolutionary biologists love themselves some phylogeny. All right. So back here we have the Nidarians and the sponges. They're just that. OK. We have the Nidarians and the sponges. We also have something called the tenophores. Look them up. They're nifty. They glow a little bit. They're cool. Take your own time with that. We also have an, a group of organisms called the deuterostomes. D E U T E R O S T O M E S. Deuterostomes. And they have, well, deuterostome development. In protostome development, the mouth forms first in the embryo. In deuterostome development, the anus forms first, and the mouth forms second. It's just what part of that digestive tract is going to be the first to form. Protostomes, things like mollusks, nematodes, arthropods, rotifers, platyhelminths, and brachiopods, their mouth forms first. For deuterostomes, like chordates, echinodermata, and hemichordata, these are going to have their anus form first and kind of form all the way to their mouth. Development of the gastric cavity, guys, that's, that's just what it is. Then we have a group called the Lophotrochozoa. L O P H O T R O C H O Z O A. Lophotrochozoa. So they have a Lophophore larva. I know. That's not really something that is easily grasped. And they have a trochophore, which is um, a trochophore is a specialized ring of cilia that they use in one of their stages of their life to obtain nutrients. And when comparing things like rotifers, annelids, and mollusks, yeah, that's as good as it gets. We have a confusing group of animals. What's going to unite them? Lopho, Troco, Zoa. Analyta, the worms, they're segmented, so they've got segmentation. Mollusks, on the other hand, advanced slide. Oh, well, yeah, Lophotrochozoa has bryozoans, rotifers, annelids, platyhelminths, and, and mollusks. Platyhelminths like, uh, oh, platyhelminths like worms. They're, they're a different type of flatworm. But let's focus on advanced slide. Mollusks.
Mollusks have a mantle, a visceral mass, and a foot. The mantle is that which secretes a shell. So in slugs, the mantle's on the outside, but doesn't secrete a shell. Okay, choose the worst one first, right? In clams, the man mantle's on the outside and secretes a shell. In squid, the mantle's on the inside and secretes the pen, which is the shell. In snails, the mantle's on the top and secretes the shell. Okay, you get the idea. The mantle's on the outside and secretes the shell. Visceral mass is things like the, uh, the gonads, the intestine, the cell, the heart, the metanephridium, the mantle cavity, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the gills, the stomach, all those different parts. The visceral mass is just the viscera. Viscera are like guts. If you eviscerate someone, it means you cut them in half and their guts spill out. So that's eviscerating. A visceral mass is, well, the guts. So then there's the foot, which is a large muscular component that it uses for movement. So a slug's foot is very long and exists along most of the body and it's used for movement. It kind of little, does a little wave so it can actually move it forward. A squid's foot, it looks like a, a large mass has been stuck to a paper shredder and comes out as tentacles. Those tentacles are the foot. The snail's foot is the part that it's putting out and walking on. So walking, snailing on, I don't know. So these are different parts for mollusks. Mollusks are interesting because they also have eyes. So we see eyes evolving in mollusks, arthropods, and fish. Uh, fish eyes would later give rise to human eyes. Yes, there we go, we're putting the humans back. But these squid eyes, uh, so eyes that evolve independently of mollusks are squid and for things like slugs. Slugs eyes are at the end of those long tentacles and the eye is held in here and actually the eye goes kind of inside and down the tentacle when it's retracted. Squid eyes have that camera lens which is kind of fancy and was mentioned earlier as a good example of convergent evolution. And the camera eye in squid has no blind spots. So another nifty fact about the mollusks. Uh, the camera eye in, oh, what are they, cuttlefish. Cuttlefish, C-U-T-T-L-E-F-I-S-H, cuttlefish. Look them up, they're nifty animals. So yeah, check some YouTube videos on cuttlefish if you want, because cuttlefish are actually capable of changing their body color, and cuttlefish are capable of lying using body color. I mean, look them up, they're an interesting group of organisms. Worst comes to worst, you're watching some YouTube videos while on your couch coughing. I mean, at least you got some YouTube videos that aren't Dr. Bodhi. Advanced slide. Ecdysozoa. And here we're adding our last bit here. Ecdysis. In the ecdysozoa, the nematodes and the arthropods. Arthropods are those that have jointed limbs. Ecdysis is the shedding of an exoskeleton. So nematodes and arthropods both do this. A bit slide. Arthropods have jointed appendages. They have hard shells, which are going to protect them from predators and make them good predators because it prevents them from drying out. So another advantage to prevent desiccation. So having these jointed appendages allows for a lot of good movement. Having an exoskeleton prevents them from drying out and serves as armor. And there is a ton of diversity here. So it says over a million species. Yeah, well over a million species. You have the mantis shrimp, which are arthropods. They've got eyes that have color. They can see colors. They have 16 different types of uh, chromophores, or not chromophores, um, color receptors that can see colors we can't even imagine. Uh, bees can see an ultraviolet and an electric. So their eyes are far more advanced than what we could think. Spiders can spin stronger fibers. Spiders can spin fibers stronger than steel. That's a great advantage. Trilobites used to live all over the ocean and were um, just huge numbers of trilobites, huge numbers of these very successful arthropods. There are many different adaptations. Remember the prokaryotes. If prokaryotes, if something can be done by a living organism, it's being done by a bacteria or some other prokaryote. 
If something can be done by a multicellular land-based animal, it's probably being done by an arthropod somewhere. There are a ton of different arthropod adaptations. Advanced slide. So going back to those deuter stones just a bit. Because our next lecture will be coming out of those. Deuter stones have that deuter stone development where the blastocyst is going to form the anus first and the mouth second. Uh, we're having in there the echinoderms, sea stars, sea urchins, and some various others. And also we're going to have the chordates. Advanced slide. Oh, back. Uh, chordates are where we're going to spend the next parts of our animal diversity. <clears throat> Those which are going to have a dorsal nerve cord. Advanced slide. And show. A bonus is they're only 36 minutes instead of 50. A minus is, yeah, they're kind of, uh, you know, it's lecture. And I know they're not the most fun things to watch. I'd really rather be with you guys in person. But just consider, if we had to close a school, we had good reason. And it's the best we have right now until you write down something in the comment section and say, hey, this is not very good. And we could do it better if we blank. Fill in those comments. I'll see you guys Wednesday. I'm already going to be recording for Wednesday. But hopefully starting soon, I'll be recording a different type and we can have a different format. Or the same if you like it. Bye.